The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon everybody. Um, welcome to today's practical procurement webinar, which is, uh, well, it's a load of rubbish basically. <laughs> Um, we uh, wanted to put together uh, some thoughts around uh, waste management and what to consider and I'm delighted uh, to have been joined by uh, Mike Callahan from GPT Waste to assist me. So um, today's agenda, um, a little introduction, a little bit about who Minerva is and uh, why GPT, um, so why we use GPT uh, for our schools. Uh, Mike will then do a brief presentation on um, waste management uh, and hopefully, well I know, will impart some really useful advice for you. There'll be a Q&A at the end and uh, then we'll wrap up. So a little bit about how this works, um, everyone on the webinar is on mute, apart from myself and Mike, obviously, um, so there's no background noise or distractions. If you have got a comment uh, or you're experiencing any sort of technical difficulties, please click on the raise my hand button, which you can see on your panel, and, and we'll respond. Um, there'll be a Q&A session at the end, so if you do want to ask Mike any questions um, at the end of the presentation, if you can please type them in the question box and I will then present these to him at the end. Um, the question box, if you're looking for it, again, is on the panel. If you click on the um, arrow, it will reveal the box and then obviously um, feel free to type your question in and I will pick those up at my end. The webinar is being recorded because I know there are a couple of people that couldn't make it live. Um, so if you do want to listen to it again or review the slides, we will send the recording to you uh, within 24 hours of the end of the event so don't worry if you miss anything you will get copies so just a very quick uh, resume on Minerva for those of you that don't know us um, we're the UK's most successful procurement consultancy focused exclusively on the school sector we don't work with any other industry um, because we know that schools have got their own unique characteristics um, which enables us to have a really sort of deep understanding of what your requirements are I don't propose to go through all the points on uh, the slide there, as I say, I'll send it to you afterwards. Um, but one thing that's worth pointing out is our guarantee that we give, which is that we guarantee you'll be completely satisfied with our work or our services won't cost you a penny. And the only reason we're able to give that guarantee is because we, we know that the quality of our, our work is, is outstanding and, uh, you know, so we give that guarantee because we, we hope and think that we'll never have it called upon. So moving on to uh, GPT Waste, why have we chosen GPT as our preferred supplier for waste management for our schools? Well, um, again, it's a very busy slide and I don't propose to run through all the bullet points on here, but effectively, you know, they are the UK's leading independent provider of waste management solutions to public and private sector. We've got some extremely large contracts with people like the MOD, the NHS and many schools. Um, they've got significant spend so they can negotiate favourable rates um, because of the volumes. Um, and again, they're fully independent, so they can use a mix of different service providers depending on the need of the clients. Um, and the other thing that's worth mentioning is that your contract with them is with GPT. So you only need to liaise with them in relation to all of your waste management issues. Um, and you have a dedicated account manager. And for all those reasons, um, that's why we um, work with them in order to um, service the needs of our clients from a waste management perspective. So I'm now going to pass over to uh, Mike to do uh, his presentation and, uh, and as I say, if you have any questions, please put them into the box throughout uh, and uh, we'll ask them um, of Mike at the end. Thank you, Lorraine. Hopefully you can all see the screen in front of you now with reference to the GPT presentation. We can yeah, indeed, yeah. Good stuff. The outline today is to provide a very simple overview in waste management. Hopefully, I won't talk a load of rubbish, and hopefully, you'll be able to recycle some of the information that I'm actually going to give to you today and some of the tips. Unbelievably, 400 million tons of waste is generated in the UK annually from a wide variety of commercial, business, the like. 400 million tons, just to give you some indication what that represents a day, it's the equivalent of filling the Royal Albert Hall with rubbish every single day, so quite significant. There's a mechanism out there which people work to, you may, you may not have come across this, it's called the waste hierarchy. The waste hierarchy is a consideration as to how to manage waste generated by an organisation. It is called the waste hierarchy simply because it's like a sliding ladder. The most preferred option is to reduce your waste. 
the, the most the option that people don't want is disposal. Hence, highlighted in red, this is significant cost to this, and it also contributes to that 400 millions of, of tons of waste that's generated every single year. I highlighted those two slides first, and the fact around the tonnage, and the fact that there's a waste hierarchy in place. This slide will show you that there is a significant cost to the disposal of this waste. It's a financial burden, and that burden actually increases, you may, may not be aware, by eight pounds a tonne every single year. The 1st of April, the cost per tonne for the landfill tax will increase from 72 pound to 80 pound. Significant. Something to be borne in mind when you're considering the waste for your school, because if you are prone to landfill tax, you're prone to the eight pound per tonne increase every single year. Obviously, we're talking about waste. Now, all schools are different in how they handle the waste, but the, obviously the waste that's generated is very, very similar. Listed here is obviously the most popular or the most frequently requested types of waste to be removed from a school. Listed at the top is general mixed waste. Predominantly, that is the highest volume of waste that is generated across the schools that we manage, that we're aware of, and that we've also discussed with other suppliers. What, what we need to consider is the general mixed waste that is the primary zone for landfill tax increase. So there are some simple steps that will reduce your exposure to this, but also put you on the right footing for a more environmental approach. Typical containers, well, depending on the volume, depending on the service provider, and depending on what you're doing at school, you will have a range of containers. The most popular type, are the Euro wheelie bins, starting from a 120 litre right through to an 1100 litre bin. For the schools and businesses that generate a little bit more waste, higher volume, then you would look to use front end loaders and rear end loaders. By volume, they hold more, and they would work out more cost effective for a, for a site. For example, the 240 litre wheelie bin that we see, four of those are equivalent to one 1100. Seven of the 1100 litre wheeler bins are equivalent to one eight yard FEL. So if you think about your school, you think about the space, you think about the volume that you're generating, some thought process should be given to the type of container that you've got. That will indicate the type of frequency, which will then obviously indicate the cost that you're going to be you know, put through to every month by your supplier. Other areas to consider as well, some colleges, some schools may generate a high volume of waste stream. So moving on from wheelie bins and FELs, I've highlighted here some compaction equipment. The compaction equipment would be used for higher, higher waste stream volume. So I talked about the eight yard FEL previously. Seven of those will be going to a, a 14 yard packer. So obviously if you're generating more waste, there's a, a large number of collections going on with FELs, then this is a solution for you. Benefits are listed there for you from volume reduction, can reduce costs, can obviously you can manage waste more effectively on the site. It all leads towards a more robust waste provision for you at the school. Volume dictates this option. Suitability would be, would, would be considered on the volume, obviously, and the space at the site as well. Now then, bailing has come onto the fore more and more over the number of years. As people may be aware of, people focus on cardboard. People saw cardboard rising to £125 a tonne. But two years ago, the, the, the market fell and it was £5 a tonne. So some, some schools now are putting bailing equipment on, not only for cardboard, but you can do this for plastics and you can do this for paper. To give you an indication, the current rebate per tonne it's £75 for cardboard, £100 for plastics, and about £50 for paper. So it's something to be considered, again, when you know what volume you have got to site. The difference with baling equipment is there's more than manual input to this. So you'd need to consider things like your operatives, your capability to extract it, but also to store it so you've got a fair volume to be able to be collected by the collection company before it goes up to be reprocessed. Something can, that, 
the bailing option is something that can provide you commercial and financial gain, but it can also impact on the labor costs that you might have to consider when you're doing the business case for this. Now we've talked about obviously the external bins, we've talked about the external type of container that you can use. The fundamental objective to achieving anything within a school environment is the internal bin mechanisms. I've been to quite a number of schools up and down the country and unfortunately what I've seen hasn't really filled my heart with great joy because it's been a general waste bin. Obviously you've got the complexities within a school environment of the pupils buying into a, a recycling program. I'll come back, I'll come to that later in a few slides down, but fundamentally we need to get the right internal bin system. The right internal bin system will ensure that you're giving yourselves the best opportunity to capture and, and, and reduce any general waste at all. And general waste, if you remember, is the one that's prone to landfill tax. Here's just listed some very, very simple images, some very, very simple schemes that can be put in place. There are umpteen types of bin type for inter inside buildings. These are res resound from multicolored, multifunctional, different sizes, right through to a very simple one. Your school can have what you want. There's enough bin types models on the market to suit exactly what you're requiring for. Internal bin systems are important for the process of recycling and the buy-in benefit. That's absolutely clear. You can see some of the benefits there. It maximizes your recycling. It actually can reduce your costs. Importantly, it improves your recycling. Everybody now has to show improved recycling. And it's something that the ethos over the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, you can consider. Tied into a business case review for external containers, your waste streams to the internal bin system, it's a very simple process to show some quick wins for you at a school. We've talked about the containers. And we've highlighted, obviously, a number of the waste streams that are generated. But something that's be going to become an important topic over the next few years is food waste. Food waste, an issue. Why is that an issue at the moment? Well, you can see there, 18 to 20 million tons a year is, it is generated in the UK. Schools have canteens, have kitchens, have to feed people. So it's going to be a significant element of the waste structure that has been generated from a school. You need to consider what and where this goes to now. The remove, if we remove waste, the food waste in particular, out of general mixed waste, theoretically, your general mixed waste becomes mixed recycler. You automatically reduce your exposure to landfill tax. That landfill tax then isn't in there because it's mixed recyclable waste. Food waste options, well, there are a number of elements around food waste going to landfill, as you can see there, 40% of the methane emissions in 2007 came from this process alone. There are service providers now that are out there that can provide solutions to this to remove the exposure to landfill. Something to be considered, all schools generate this waste. It may be going down a macerator at the moment. Macerators have to be taken into consideration, but in the pipeline, the next three to four years, it's highly likely that these will become um, defunct. A lot of the water companies now are, are, are pushing and lobbying for the removal of macerators simply because they are the ones that are having to pay for the cleaning of, of, of the water by removing the, the, the food waste out of it through macerators, something to consider. There are solutions available in place for food waste highlighted two very simple ones here for you. One is an on-site solution and one would be an off-site solution. The on-site solution is the use of a waste to um, piece of kit which we can obviously provide more information to later via the Minerva website. This solution here, very simply, your kitchen waste is put into the machine through a number of enzymes the, the food waste is broken down within 24 hours. 200 kilos can be broken down within 24 hours. The residue from this process is grey water, exactly the same as the dishwater and as the washing machine that you might have at home or in school already. The good thing with this piece of kit, the enzymes keep working once they leave the piece of machinery. In the pipe work, it can actually break down your fats, oils, and greases. That, in turn, 
can actually reduce any rodent issues you may have in the pipe works as the enzymes keep breaking this food waste down. Fat would obviously be for skills generating 200 kilos a day. It is quite a substantial amount, but it's a very good process. And these are tending to prove cost efficient after 18 months. So going forward, the skills of potentially 1,000 to 1,500, then it's an option to consider. The other option is on-site sol off solutions through. We've highlighted the number of wheeler bins and, and FELs earlier, the 120, 240 litre wheeler bin. A number of suppliers would supply caddies to you, and you can see the typical type of caddy on the bottom of the slide there. Your kitchen waste is put into the caddy. When the caddy is full, the bag is tied, and it's placed into the 120, 240 litre wheeler bin. Depending on the volume that the site is generating, these euro bins can be exchanged daily, weekly, twice a week. The normal type of service is that the wheelie bins would be removed and clean, sanitized ones would be replaced. So there are no odor issues, there are no rodent issues. The food waste is not going to landfill, it would be going through to a process of anaerobic digestion, stroke composting. From your perspective, you have got a solution for food waste you can show a clear delivery of recycling the food waste. It's not going to landfill. And this is the significant contamination that you would find. The wet waste, if you like, in any general mixed waste is what we have to consider to get to be mixed recyclables. We've talked about the bin types. We've talked about the waste streams. We've talked a little bit about the collections. Some of you may be aware of where your waste goes to. Some of you may not be aware of where your waste goes to. You may have a council service. You might have a, a private contractor that comes on to remove your waste. All of the waste that is collected commercially has to go through to a material recycling facility. If you're not aware of what one of those is, the next couple of slides will just give you a very brief summary outline of how your waste is managed at site. Material recycling. It's fundamental to what we have to consider when we're producing waste. The recycled material and the waste material is taken to one of these facilities in theory to be sifted and sorted so it can be re-engineered here. Here is a very, very simple example of a, a plastics milk bottle which the majority of schools I would have thought would generate. It's put into a recycling bin. It's picked up by the supplier. It's identified as to what grade of plastic it is. It's then chipped. It is then obviously broken down into the, the polymer that is remolded into a plastic bottle. It is taken to a supermarket to be generated back into a milk carton. As you can see, it's a very, very simple process. The next slide here shows you some of the actual images from some of the material recycling facilities or MERFs that we utilize. They're very noisy, they're very busy. In the summer, it can be quite smelly, but they do a fundamental thing in being able to recycle waste. Nothing is sent direct to landfill. Everything goes through a process. You can see here when the waste gets um, arrives at the facility, it's fluffed up. It's air taken into it, and you can identify black bags, clear bags, and some cardboard. The middle image shows you a trommel, rather like a great big washing machine with various blowers, different size holes that can actually suck out different size paper, cardboard, brick and block, an amazing piece of kit. These pieces of kit cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds. The final image shows you, obviously, the hand picking and sorting that anything could come out to the other side of the trommel. This ensures that any recyclable material, where possible, is identified and it is picked out. The end process here, then, is that they would go into designated bays and be bailed. So you would have things for your plastics, your cardboards, your papers, any of those waste streams there. A very, very simple process, very effective. To give you a quick example of how waste is recycled, you've seen some of the images there, an aluminium can. Again, from a school, a lot of the schools have vending machines, plastic bottles, cans. This is the process here. Your aluminium can would be taken away by the, the vehicle. Goes through, obviously, the eddy currents and the magnets to sort out steel from aluminium. It's baled. The baled waste from a MRF, half-ton bales, would then be put onto a curtain cider, approximately 20 to 30 tons a load, would then go off to the metal reprocessing facility. You've all drove down the, 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 the motorways and seen 
the lorries with the with the aluminium cube on 1.5 million aluminium cans has gone in to make this. It's exactly the same process here. The smelting of obviously the tins brings out the, cube, the, the aluminium cube. It is then reused to design who knows what. Everything's in there. It's all a very, very simple process. To give you an idea of some examples of the waste streams, when they've gone through to a MRF, when they've been bailed, when they've gone for re-engineering, you will see here some examples of what happens to plastics, to glass, to cardboard, aluminium, and some of the tin cans. The re-engineering process is very critical to the UK economy. The more that we can recycle, the less we have to import raw material to make product again. So simple things you may or may not wear. Glass waste. Glass is broken down. It's actually 80% of recycled glass is used in road aggregate. It's an amazing fact that that is the case. Plastics, your plastics, hard rigids, whatever, are broken down, made into tables, chairs, garden furniture is a, is a one that's coming to the fore now. And obviously, a lot of the decking now, people are making the plastic decking out of the recyclable plastics. It's all a big industry. It's something that we have to do to make sure that this is capable to happen. We have to ensure that we're recycling at the front end. And we've talked about containers, we've talked about waste streams, we've talked about the MRF, the material recycling process. Some people might have this flippant attitude, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't matter, I've got somebody else to do it. Fundamentally, there is a duty of care legislation. You as the producer have a specific responsibility to manage and ensure that the disposal of your waste is done legally. There's a fundamental piece of legislation, Environmental Protection Act 1990, Section 34 lists this. There will be a link for you to access all the individual elements of legislation that are relating to you, and you can review and you can see. If you don't adhere to this, there's only one result, and I'm afraid that'll be prosecution. Don't jump up and down and think, oh no, I've got to panic. Some things for you to consider now, you know, you've got service providers in place, do you have signed waste transfer notes? Have you got a season ticket from them reference to any trade waste collections? Have you got any documentation at all that demonstrates the waste that you've got and is being removed by that supplier is being disposed of and it meets the obligations? Simple questions to ask your service provider. You should have them in place for any inspection or audit that you may take. Just check that they're in date. Check the license numbers. Do you receive a, a monthly waste management data sheet? That should indicate what's happening at your site. It should show you recycling figures, tonnages, container options, the frequency of the service, and also importantly, identify the waste stream. If you haven't got any of those, simply ask the service provider for them. You need to have these in place. Some of you may be coming to the period of time when contracts are up for renewal, and you might be thinking to yourself, what do I do now? How do I ensure that my you know, service provider that I'm talking to is compliant? is somebody that I want to do business with. Something that we do as part of our approval supplier register, something that I'll be quite happy to pass to you. There's a number of bullet points down at the bottom. Ask for these. Ask for the waste management license or their own permit. Ask for the waste carrier's license. Have a look at their insurance liability certificates. Ask them for a health and safety policy. The more and more that you ask, and if you're receiving this information, it kind of shows you that the service provider that you're looking at is compliant, is quite transparent and is happy to give you the information that not only that you should have, but obviously they're answering the questions that you want to. It gives you that peace of mind, shows that you're carrying out your duty of care. That is the fundamental thing that revolves back to you. Talking about legislation, in Scotland, for the schools and businesses and commercial outlets in Scotland, some new regulations came into force on the 1st of January. You should have been made aware of these by your supplier previous to this. However, if not, very, very simple bullet point here. As of the 1st of January, any business within Scotland should be making inroads into showing a pathway of segregation at site. Simple waste streams being glass, metal, stroke aluminium, the plastics, paper and card. These need to be segregated. As a minimum, you can have those as classed as mixed recyclable waste. A number of suppliers in Scotland are offering mixed recyclable waste simply because they know that the individual waste streams don't merit individual collections because the volume isn't there. This may change in the future as volume increases. At the moment, any school in Scotland should have a mixed recyclable collection and a general waste. 
There's another element to this as well, which is quite significant, and that's the reason why I identified the food waste slide earlier on. In Scotland now, any business that generates 50 kilos of waste a week has to have a dedicated service. Why is this important? Well, if it's in Scotland now, you can bet your bottom dollar it's going to come into England and Wales in the future, be it in 18 months, two years, three years, four years' time. So it would be good practice for schools to start to operate, to change their service provision, to understand and to forecast what potentially might happen. So as of now, schools that generate 50 kilos or more in Scotland have to have a dedicated service. Service. You should have been advised by your current service provider. If you haven't, it's something that Minerva can assist you with. Something that's going to happen in January the 16th, uh, 5th of January 2016, businesses that generate between 5 and 50 kilo will then have to segregate and have a separate collection as well. So it's being drilled down into the vol volume of this. So it's something to consider, something to be aware of in England and Wales, but in Scotland it's something you have to have in place now. Anybody that doesn't, quite simply, there's a fine. There's a fine of £10,000. So consideration needs to be given to that to ensure that you have carried out your duty of care and you're compliant with the, obviously, the regulations up there. The impact of not doing this, well, quite simply, we've talked about the increased cost. You're not bothered, you're not interested, £8 a tonne landfill tax, there you go, every single year. Also, if you're not meeting your legislation, then you're going to be fined as well. You could be increasing your carbon footprint by not having the right bin, identified with the white waste stream, identify with the right frequency of collection. Look at the alternatives on the volume to the container type. You know, we're talking about recycling. If you don't do anything, you're not going to recycle. You're not going to achieve your accreditations because you are not being proactive. Simple things can be done to do that. Landfill will increase. We're going to have more Royal Albert Halls produced every single day. It's not where we need to go. It's going to impact on, obviously, CSR policies. And it's also going to impact on schools, H&S in the workplace. Health and safety, critical. They are the things that you've got to consider if you, do, if you don't do anything. What's the role in waste management? What is your role? Your role running as a bursar, somebody at the school who's engaged in this role. Do you engage in waste management? Do you engage? Do you have anything at all that you can show that you're delivering something in place? Do you segregate? Do you know what waste is that you can segregate? Have you any idea of what the volumes are? Do you have the right bins? Do you have the right frequency? These are things that you need to consider. You need to plan. And there's an approach to this. You can conduct a site survey. You can review this. Simple things will show you simple ways of how you can actually save money, be very green, increase your financial sustainability, improve your operational capacity, but most importantly of all, have the right environmental impact of your school's waste. You might be thinking, where do I start? Well, it's simple. Very, you're in a school environment. People want to learn. People are there to learn. People's awareness is there. Have you developed a recycling guide? There's a very simple approach. It doesn't need to be a thesis. One page is enough. Images say more than a thousand words. Have you ever considered holding a waste awareness event? There may be pupils in the school who want to join a recycling green team. Every household in the UK now has to do some form of recycling. Let's utilize what's going on at home within a school environment and build a picture. Do you send out recycling reminders? Do, do you do anything environmental? Do you have anything on the school internet? Simple things like this. Do you have you performed a questionnaire? Have you been to the MIRF, part of your duty care? Have you been to the, the, your current service provider's material recycling facility? If you haven't, do one. See if they can obviously allow a number of pupils to attend, build that picture up. A number of the MIRFs, a number of the good MIRFs now have educational programs attached to them which will assist you with this. Profile the school recycling practices. Do you do bin signage? Have you got the right labels on the right bins? Are bins that should be used locked? Everything from the headmaster through to the bursars, the teachers, the cleaning team, to the pupils, to your service provider, all dictate a very fluid situation. Something to be considered, something to build in. It's a, it's a great process to show that everybody's pulling in the right direction. It, it, it really is. Recycling, it really depends on you. And the, the process is here. I wanted to highlight a very simple process to consider 
when you want to implement recycling. Consider the options about your waste stream. Consider your types of bin that you might use. Consider your volume. Internally, consider your communication and your profiling and start to build a picture of what you may be doing, what you're not doing, and put a plan together of how to get there. Minerva can assist, GPT can assist, absolutely no problem at all. Hope that makes sense to you. I hope I haven't talked a load of rubbish, and hopefully you've recycled some of the ideas that are in there. Thank you. Mike, thank you very much. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, so uh, just to uh, finalise, uh, if I can just get my screen up properly. Um, so um, yes, thank you very much. We have had some questions come in, so uh, let me just uh, sort those out. Give me a second. Okay, so um, the first question, Mike, um, that's come in is that the graph for landfill tax, um, it yeah. ended at 2014. So yeah. did I hear you right that um, it was eight pounds it's going up eight pounds per ton every year from eight here on. Per tons. It, at the moment, it was due to finish in 2014. However, it is going to continue. There is no clear definitive as to when it will finish. There has been talk that um, potentially around 2016 that the government are talking about having a taxation on particular waste streams if they aren't sent to recycling facilities. So what we can consider, and there is engagement going on, there's lobbying going on at the moment as to how this fits in. There may be a tax on cardboard if you aren't recycling cardboard going forward. There may be a tax on glass. There may be a tax on food waste. At the moment, it's £8 a tonne for the next couple of years. So you're at £80. First of April this year, we go up to £80. The next two years, it, it's going to be up to £96 a tonne. That is significant. When you consider... The cost per tonne for mixed recyclables is potentially around about between 30 and 35 pound. Significant difference in cost per tonne rates there. It makes sense for everybody to connect from a financial perspective. If you have a school that's generating 150 tonnes a year of general mixed waste, you times that by 96 pound. Work out the sum. I'm sorry, I can't do it. I'm not very mathematical, but 100 times 35 and work out the difference there. That's a significant cost saving to a school without really doing anything major apart from putting some simple recycling programs in place. Brilliant, yeah, thank you for that. Um, our next question is, um, this is an interesting one, I don't know the answer to this, um, our, boys, our boys collect glass for recycling and take it to the bottle bank. I've heard this is illegal, yeah. is that true? I'm not going to say who's, obviously, I'm not going to say who submitted that question for fear of getting well, them into trouble. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure, if the bottling bank is off site and it might be a community, facility, a community amenity, theoretically, no way should be leaving the site and being relocated elsewhere and put in a bottle bank there. If the bottle bank's already on the school, I can't see any problem with that. I, I would theorize that what they're suggesting here, that the glass waste is collected on a site, it's put into a car, it's transported to a civic amenity site, and it's offloaded there. Technically, that shouldn't be happening because it, it's not, it waste isn't being classified. There's no signed docket, for example. You can't prove what you've done with your waste glass so if you're getting inspected where does it go well um, there you go that's the question that you need to consider um, any waste that's generated on the site should be dealt with accordingly by having the appropriate container and, and the like put on there I'm theorizing that that question has come from somebody who's actually taking it away because there are a number of examples in reference to milk bottles toner cartridges that we're aware of that people in environments commercial and educational are getting in their car and taking it away or taking it to home and putting it in their own recycling bin at home. We've even had certain instances where certain clients are burning paper on the site as the, and they're classing that as their secure shredding. The secure destruction isn't really the best way to go about doing this because you can't prove that it's happened. You haven't disposed of it in a, an environmentally sound process. So. I'm quite happy to have that conversation and a private email if that would be just to clarify the situation, but I would assume that that waste stream has been removed either to a civic community or to a home environment and disposed of that way, and that way shouldn't really be done. 
Okay, thank you. Um, one final question. Um, you mentioned macerators and the fact that obviously, yeah. you know, they're sort of campaigning for them to be banned. Um, yeah. What about anaerobic digestion on site? Is that is that something that's... Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely correct. The, the, the thing with this, and I've highlighted it with the compactors and with the balance, it's volume driven. There are, and as you can imagine, it's still in its infancy at the moment. There are some big AD facilities being built. However, there are a number of organizations now that have identified that there's smaller opportunities on universities, smaller factories and the like that are generating food waste that could be put in with, with AD. At the moment, there isn't enough to suffice purely for the food waste. It might have to be mixed in with certain other elements of waste streams to make it viable. But I would suggest by the time macerators are being phased out or made illegal, then there will be a solution. That's another reason why this thing isn't going to happen overnight, because you cannot ban macerators. And you think about they are all over the UK without there being a sufficient opportunity for the food waste to be disposed of in other areas. And cost, I'm afraid, is going to pay a factor to this. Something has to be cost effective. If it isn't, it will remain in the general mix waste or, or it, will, it will be disposed of in other ways. So technology is advancing. Investment is being made into small AD facilities that can be on site, but it is purely volume driven. You have to have a commercial return on this, and that is down to the waste that's been generated. Brilliant. That is great. Thank you very much indeed. That's much appreciated. No um, so um, that's uh, that's it uh, for today's presentation. Thank you very much to everybody who's joined us. Um, as mentioned earlier, we will send a recording of this webinar out to you. So if you want to um, look back at any of the slides or information, then you'll be able to. Um, my email address and Mike's are both on there, as are our websites for you to go and have a look. Um, and Mike mentioned about a link to uh, a website for waste legislation. The link to that is at the bottom there. Um, and that is a fabulous site in terms of it will tell you pretty much anything you need to know from a, a legislative perspective. That's easy for me to say. Um, so thank you very much everyone for joining us. If you have any questions or anything else you'd like to know, please do get in touch. Otherwise, we look forward uh, to uh, you hopefully joining us for the webinar next month. Many thanks indeed.